Hello everybody, I'm back again. I know what you're thinking, this guy can't even work the camera while he's doing video reviews. Anyway, I'm back and I'm going to talk about the other show that I saw in Chicago. That's my dog again, he's being loud. Um, I went to the second preview performance of War Paint. Uh, it's the new musical by the authors of Grey Gardens and... Uh, book by Doug Wright, music by Scott Frankel, and lyrics by Michael Corey. Um, and this show had a lot of hype going up to it. It's got an all-star cast. Um, Patti Lapone and Christine Ebersole lead it. Um, and John Dossett uh, plays a supporting role. And Douglas Sills, all great Broadway alums. Uh, a little bit of backstory on the musical. The plot is actually pretty simple. Um, back in the 30s, spanning through the 50s, um, the cosmetic industry was really finding its way and experimenting with new products and trying to figure out what worked. And Elizabeth Arden, uh, she, her company is still around and you've probably seen it in the store. It's the iconic red door. You can't miss it. Um, and... Helena, Helena Rubinstein were the two big female presidents um, and leaders of a really um, male-dominated world of cosmetics, which is hard to believe. Um, and the funny thing is, in real life, they never actually met each other. But they were always just trying to um, one-up each other and get the upper hand on each other. Um, I feel like I'm saying um a lot. I'm sorry. It's late. It starts out... Excuse me just a minute. I gotta be with my dog. Oh. It's my dog. He's gonna go on the bed now. Anyway, back to war paint. Um, it starts out, um lights up on Christine Ebersole and Patti Lapone, and they are at their um, makeup stations applying makeup and the prologue is basically just explaining what makeup means to them. Uh, then as you go on, um, there's a song immediately after called Behind the Red Door and it takes you inside of one of Elizabeth, Arden, Elizabeth Arden's salons and it's a really cute number. Levi, he's such a Oh, he's mugging me right now. He's mugging the camera. Anyway, um, it's a really, really cute number, and um, Elizabeth Arden's thing was she really put packaging and appearance over the effect of the product. So everything in the salon was pink, and her um, workers were just dressed to the nines, and... Uh, she makes a surprise visit to her salon, and she comes in, and it's a great moment, and, you know, she gets re-entrance applause after the beginning. Um, and then, the really interesting thing about this musical is that the plot is linear, but in a very weird way, seeing as the two women, they never met each other in real life, so they never really have any moments together, but they do. It'll be like you've got this one scene and it's about Elizabeth Arden and she's talking about Helena Rubinstein and you know what her next move is going to be and what's going on in her personal life. Uh, and then you'll have a Helena Rubinstein scene and you know she's doing the same thing, just talking about Elizabeth Arden. Uh, so then it cuts to Patti Lapone's character, Helena Rubinstein, and she's just arriving back in New York and she's opening a new salon that just happens to be right within blocks of Elizabeth Arden's. And it's funny that they never went out of each other's way to meet each other. Uh, it was a really kind of diva-ish culture, and they were both very proud of their work. Uh, so she's back, and she's got her new salon, and she's got her new line coming up, and her right-hand man, played by Douglas Sills, whose name was Harry Fleming, uh, he 
comes up with this great idea. So basically, they both, both um, cosmetic CEOs, their companies both release um, face creams. And their Elizabeth Arden's is in a nice, pretty box, and it's a glass container and everything, and it's selling really well. And Helena Rubinstein, Helena, I keep saying that, Helena Rubinstein's, um, is just in, like, a white container with a black top. And they're trying to figure out why Elizabeth Arden's is selling so much more, and it's because of the appearance. So he, um, Douglas Sills' character, Harry Fleming, comes up with the idea that you have a day and a night cream, so it makes it look like it works better, and then sales boom on that. Um, and then back over with Elizabeth Arden, uh, John Dossett, put John Dossett played her husband, then ex-husband, uh, later on in the show he becomes her ex-husband, uh, named Tommy Lewis, and he's kind of, um, their company's head of sales. Um, what happens next? There's a lot that happens in this show, and then some little happens as well. Um, so back to Helena Rubinstein, the song they sing about you know, getting the cream to sell more. It's called Hope in a Jar. It's a great, great, great number. And then, like I said, back at Arden's office, um, Elizabeth and Tommy sing a song about how they're making their marriage work, even though she's kind of the CEO of this company and he works under her. Um, and then, long story short, um, Elizabeth, not Elizabeth, um, Helena Rubenstein, I keep getting them mixed up. I'm trying to call them by their character's name and not the actor names, just to suit the story. Um, Helena goes, her right-hand man in sales, who came up with the whole Hope in a Jar campaign, uh, that Douglas still played Harry Fleming, uh, they're out at dinner, and they kind of have a weird kind of boundaries relationship where they're not dating, he's gay, and she basically just needs a companion. So, you know, he asked her for, you know, a raise because he came up with this whole great ad campaign that sold, you know, that made them a ton of money. And she declines, and they kind of have this fight, and as he's leaving, he runs into Elizabeth Arden, who has overheard the fight they've had, and he and she basically says, here's my card if you want to be, like, appreciated for your work give me a call, and we can talk. So that basically kind of sets a little bit of something in motion there. And then he takes her up on and he goes and has a meeting with her. And then her husband, who is played by John Dossett, walks in and he gets all angry that, you know, he's being replaced and there's no respect and all that. And he leaves frustrated and, long story short... He comes back home with a girl and gets caught by Elizabeth Arden and they get a divorce. Um, what happens next? So much happens. Um, so basically that's the majority of what happens in Act 1. Um, the beginning of Act 2, it's the start of World War II. And, oh, I remember what happens at the end of Act 1, sorry. At the end of Act 1, um, they kind of get... Oh, that's another thing I didn't mention, that Elizabeth Arden's ex-husband that cheated on her goes to work for Helena Rubinstein. So they each have each other's old right-hand man, and they divulge secrets, and basically they tip off the government and sue each other, of what's in their pro sue each other about what's in their products. And so there's this whole period of the show, probably about a 15-minute period of the show, where they're in court and they're trying to fight the FDA and all that. Um, and that basically closes out Act 1. Then Act 2 starts, as I said, with the... Um, it's like the beginning of World War II. And... They're having to make adjustments with their products because during the war effort they had to, like, reserve their supplies of, like, um, silicone 
and like paste and paper. So they had to like just redo everything and find new ways to make products without using these essential ingredients that women might still buy during the depression. And there's the great title number, it's called War Paint. And um, it's basically them just devising their plan. Um, and then it's starting to, like I said, this whole musical spans over about 20 years. Um, and then, you know, the war effort is continuing, and TV is starting to come more and more into play in terms of advertising, and they both get offers from CVS to put their products on the air, but they both reject, because they don't think... Elizabeth Arden says something like, I don't want my, you know, luxurious product, you know, seen right after a commercial for motor oil, basically. So they both pass on that, and then, um, Revlon, the company Revlon, decides to take it up, and their sales go through the roof. Um, so both Elizabeth Arden and Helena Rubinstein... They're both facing money loss because they're not making what they used to. Um, and it's just a recession. Um, Helena Rubinstein sells off a ton of her portraits and Patti Lapone sings a great song. Uh, what was it called? Where'd it go? I think it was Forever Beautiful. And she has to auction off all her paintings to make ends meet. And, um, Christine Ebersol's character has to, um, close down some salon. So they're all making cuts and everything. Uh, and then cut to, uh, Elizabeth Arden's office. And she has a meeting with her new advisor from the board. Because she's the president of the company and she's the face of the company. But she also has, like, a board of advisors. Um... And she learns that they want to basically replace her. Uh, they want to keep her name. They want to keep her signature color, which was pink. And um, they want to find somebody younger to represent the brand. Because she was an aging woman and makeup was going towards the um, younger crowd. So, she sings a really, really beautiful, beautiful ballad. It's a great 11 o'clock number called Pink. Um, and then, towards the end, they're both asked to speak at this business conference for women in business. And I'd say about now, probably through the... It actually says it right here. We're in the 60s. So, they're both aged uh, from the show started quite a bit. And they're... They tried to get Elizabeth Arden, and then, for this business conference, and she canceled. So they asked Helena Rubinstein, and she accepted. And then the chairperson, the chairwoman of the conference, is up at the podium, and she gets word that Elizabeth Arden is actually coming. coming. So that puts them in a really, really awkward situation. And they run into each other in the dressing rooms. It's the first time they've ever actually been aware of each other for the entire show. Um, which I'll come to a point about that later. Um, and they basically have this discussion about, you know, the makeup industry and what they have done to the American woman. If it was a good thing or a bad thing. Because on one hand, the cosmetics get, gave some women, it gave them confidence, it gave them purpose, it made them feel like they were pretty. Then on the other hand, it played into the stereotype of what the perfect woman should be. So they have this really, really great discussion in a song about whether or not what they did in pioneering this industry was for good or bad. And it was a really, really interesting question to pose. Uh, and that's basically the plot of the show in a not very short nutshell, because I ramble, ramble, but this was a really, really big show. Um, and going back to what I said before, a little bit of a plot inaccuracy that the, um, composers kind of overlooked is that they never actually, well, they didn't overlook, they intentionally overlooked it. It's that they never actually met in real life, but they wrote that scene at the end where they meet with each other. It's a small thing, and I can't decide whether or not I like it or not, because the question that it poses is deep and profound, but it's also historically inaccurate. 
So, you kind of have to take it at face value, and I think I liked it, because it, it, it gave um, a really, really great book scene for them to talk during. The set was um, big, but also extremely simple and elegant, if that makes any sense. Um, I'd say probably at least 80% of the show, the stage is divided in half, with Elizabeth Arden's desk on one side and Helena Rubinstein's on the other. And they basically would do these split scenes where it's like, Helena's talking about Elizabeth, and then Black Eye on this side, then this side, and Elizabeth's talking about Helena. Um, really, really neat book scenes, and there were a lot of songs like that, because they did have some duets, they just weren't singing with each other. There was the act one closer, which was called Face to Face, and they're basically just talking about, you know, how nice it would be to talk to somebody who knew what they were going through, because they were women in a men's game very early on in the 20th century. Uh, so overall, oh, the costumes were brilliant. They were gorgeous. The jewelry was gorgeous. Um, so yeah, and the score was just brilliant. If you like Grey Gardens, you'll definitely like this. They both, I think I counted and they have two solos each and then they have uh five songs where they duet at some point and then their ensemble songs that they lead stuff like that so they're featured a lot it's a great star vehicle to see your favorite broadway divas in um so this show is selling really really well at the goodman theater in chicago it's extended twice, two weeks past its original end date. Um, so definitely try to see it in Chicago, but I think there is no question at this point that the show will transfer to Broadway, and I highly, highly, highly recommend you check out War Paint, um, either at the Goodman or in New York when it transfers. This video is running long, so I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you so much.